What's going on, Rocky? How are you today? Why don't you stand with me? We're going to worship Jesus with all that we have because he is worthy of it today. So come on, let's lift our voices. Let's sing right to him together. Here we go. Sing this out. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Because he opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling songs away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Amen. Let's sing about what Jesus has done for us, the life that we have, the freedom that we have in him. Sing this out. We were the beggars. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the priests. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, sing it again. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out Your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it one more time. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. And now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Amen. Let's keep singing together. Sky from rivers to 
next song we have a baptism that happened this past week that we get to show today and when we show that let's celebrate join with heaven to respond and just be thankful for this decision that was made to follow Jesus let's sing this out all this time you've been right by my side The cloud by day, the glow of fire by night. Oh, why would I doubt you? Why would I fear? You've proven you're faithful, proven you're near. I know that all this time you've been right by my side. Sing this out together. You're a loving, patient, faithful God, and your kindness leads us through sea and storm. Where there should have been a grave, you may. Peace. 
Sing this out. Never far. Never far away, you're never late. The hands of heaven, holy as I wait. Oh, you're the provider forever and ever. You're proving your faith, you're proving your love. sing that one more time, just that chorus, I invite you to sing out of what Jesus has done for us, out of the fact that he died on the cross to give us freedom today, so sing this out. I throw up my hands. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, cause 
I love coming out of this week of Thanksgiving where we celebrated Thanksgiving because uh, it's such a reminder and kind of just a hit for me to remember to be thankful. And that seems like maybe a silly thing, but I think for me, oftentimes I find myself not thankful for things that just kind of happen when in reality I should be extremely thankful. And one of the areas that I, I see that in is in what Jesus has done for me. And this past week I was reading in Luke chapter 17, and there's a story, Jesus is traveling, and as he's traveling, he runs into uh, 10 people who have leprosy, who have this skin disease, and he, they come running up to him, and they're begging him to heal them, and he says, go to the priest, and you'll be healed, and so they all, they run off to the priest, they go to him, and they're all healed, and then one of them comes back to Jesus and worships him and thanks him for what he did. The other nine just go off and continue living their lives healed of that disease. And as I was reading it, something struck me, and it was this, that I find that pretty often I'm one of the nine who go away, who have something happen and I go off and I, I don't think about it anymore. I don't go back and thank Jesus for that thing. And today, I want for me and for us that to be different. It's my prayer that we become that one leper who comes back to Jesus to thank him for what he did, to thank him for the fact that we have salvation in him, that we have hope in him today. And so maybe if you're in this room and you haven't done that, you haven't decided to follow Jesus, I want you to know he loves you. He is there for you right now, just like the song we just sang. All this time, he's been right by my side, and that's not untrue for you either. He is with you always. So as the people of God, let's take communion together to be reminded of that truth, to be thankful to him, to respond to him for what he's done in our lives. When you're ready, take the bread and the juice. Lord Jesus, we worship you today. God, we gather in this room together today to tell you that we are thankful for who you are. That you, the Son of God, would come to this earth, God, to give us freedom, to defeat sin, to defeat darkness. And so today, God, we worship you for that truth. Lord Jesus, we love you. We celebrate what you are doing. And I pray that we join in your mission right now. So God, it's in your powerful and holy name that we pray, amen. So who are you? Who are you? Here's who you are. You're the one who Jesus picked first. That's you. That's who you are. Who are you? 
You are the one who was predestined by God to be adopted into his family if you would believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You know who you are? You're a son and daughter of God. That's who you are. Who are you? Really, who are you? Here's who we are. We are the chosen. Church, how are we doing this morning? Everybody good? Awesome. Uh, hey, we want to welcome in our NIWAD campus, everybody who's hanging out with us online. Thanks for being with us. Amanda, that video had everything to do with baptism celebration. It did. It was amazing. I think this past year we had more baptisms than we almost ever have mm -hmm. in the history of Rocky. Mm -hmm. Right? That's something to celebrate. You yeah, guys should clap awesome. for that. But we're not done yet. So December 12th, both campuses, we're going to have a baptism service. So maybe you guys are sitting here and you're thinking, I have more questions. I've been wanting to get baptized, but I don't know what that actually means. We have a video. You guys can go to Rocky.Church this week. Our lead pastor, Sean, did a video. Go to the link. Check it out. If you have questions, ask Matt or I. We'd love to chat with you about it. But December 12th, both campuses, baptism celebration. Yeah, and if you've been around here for a while, you know these baptism celebration weekends are amazing, even if you're not getting baptized. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. it's just one of those... Sunday. It's just so awesome to be in the room and celebrate uh, these folks that are going public with their faith. So I want you to be here uh, on December 12th. It's going to be amazing. And again, like Amanda said, if you've got some questions about possibly jumping in and, and being baptized, uh, we want to do everything we can uh, to serve you well, answer all of your questions. So don't, uh, don't hesitate to reach right. out to, uh, to one of us. Now, uh, today is a little bit different. In fact, we're making history. You didn't even know it. We're making history <laughs> uh, because Amanda and I are on the, the same stage at the same time on a Sunday. For the outside, first time ever. For the first time ever when we've yeah. had services at both of our campuses. And if you don't know Amanda, she serves at the Niwad campus. Niwad campus, give her some love right now. That would, be, hey. that would be embarrassing if Fred clapped, right? but Niwa didn't. So right. I hope Niwa, they clap. You better have clapped. I, 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 hope they, yeah. I hope they clap. But if you don't, uh, if you don't know us, we, we are uh, campus pastors here at, at Rocky. I serve primarily here at Fred campus, Amanda over at the Niwa campus. And today um, we're, we're jumping into uh, our Ephesians series. And we're, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, you can turn there. And we're doing things a little bit different because um, the topic that Paul talks about um, we, we thought it would just be healthy for us as a church uh, to walk through this more in a conversational way right. uh, than a, more of a, a preaching way or a teaching way. Um, and so uh, I made this little living room for us. So, this yeah, is nice. This I is like real it. nice. I like and, it. and I was like, you know what? It would be nice to sit down while you teach every once in a while. So anyways, we've got this. This is, this is what he actually does when we're not <laughs> here on Sundays, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're just going to sit down for a sec. And, um, and the reason why we thought it'd be good for Amanda and I to, to kind of chat about uh, some of the content in, in Ephesians 5 is because I think it's helpful. It's going to be helpful for us to get not just a guy's perspective, but also um, a lady's perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in that, um, it'll help us just kind of learn and grow a little bit in it. Now, I'll be honest. Um, the, the verse that we're going to tackle first, I don't, I just don't get. <laughs> you're, you're really going to go I, there? I, yeah, I don't get why it's so tough. I mean, okay. and I'm, I've been saying this for years. I'm a literalist, you know. Whatever the Bible says, I just go with it. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think it's pretty clear what it says. I'm going to let you read it, and, um, and we'll just see what conclusions we come to. You're starting off with a bang. Go ahead. All right. Uh, we're going to dive right in. Like Matt said, if you guys have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians 5. And I'm going to start in verse 22. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. Are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. Yep. Go ahead. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. All right, let's pray. I think it's very simple. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, now, here's what, I, here's what I know. Here's what I know about that verse, okay? That verse is probably in the top three to five most misunderstood verses in the Bible. Would you agree? For sure. For sure. I heard it, an amen out here. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Someone's like, yes, and they're <laughs> yes. nudging their husband right now, like, yes. listen. Um, so here, here's what I know, in all seriousness, that there are people um, in the world, there are people maybe even in this service who's watching and listening that want nothing to do with the church because of that verse. Oh, yeah. Some of you, when I read that verse, you just, you shifted yeah. in your seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, maybe I want to leave. Yeah. yeah. And... 
And it's probably because either A, you grew up um, with somebody or within the context of a church that leveraged that verse the wrong way, right? right? So you have a story. Um, or it's just because um, you, you're still on a journey in your faith, discovering who God is. Maybe you're not a Christian and, and you bump into um, a preacher preaching that or you bump into a conversation in the context of church or just church culture. Yes. And you, and you go, I, that, that's why I want nothing to do with the church um, because of, of that very thing um, right there. So here's the deal. If you're here and you're a Christian, um, it's good that you're here so we can be reminded <laughs> about what Paul is actually saying. Um, and if you're here, you're not a Christian. I'm so glad that you're here because this might be one of the conversations that's keeping you from engaging with God more. And so what we want to do today is we want to bring some, some clarity and we want to have a verse here that, that I'm going to argue, we're going to argue is actually a really good verse. <laughs> Um, and is very really healthy for, for all of us when we understand it in the right context and understand what Paul's actually, actually saying. And one of the reasons why I think there's so much tension in that verse for us in our culture today is because we are reading it 2,000 years after Paul wrote it. And I think what's helpful for us is to think about how would men and women receive that verse 2,000 years ago? And I think they would actually receive it much differently than how we receive it. For sure. And I would just say this, ladies in the room, I'm going to say this, just hang with me, all right, all the way through. I know there's tension in this. But if we go back 2,000 years to when Paul wrote this verse, and he was talking to first century Christians at that time, and so culturally, very, very different. And the thing about that verse, the very thing that we think represents weakness, it makes us cringe, it makes us shift in our seats, it actually would have been empowering to the women in that culture, mm. which is a little bit of shock to us, right? And so when Paul wrote that letter, not one woman would have been standing around saying like, what did you say? Like we do, that it didn't happen. And Richard Foster made this statement, I love it. He said, Paul made decision makers out of those who were forbidden to make decisions. Because the thing is that husbands in that time, back in 2,000 years ago, they had ownership over their wives. And so when he said, hey, wives submit to your husbands, he was giving them choice. He was giving them freedom. And so it was very empowering. And I think just as we walk through this conversation, remember that. Remember the culture he was writing to and then what we're talking about today. Yeah, so we get there's, there's tension in there. But what we don't want you to do is then dismiss the rest of the conversation. Right. We want you to work through that. Uh, a little bit. And the reason why there's tension, because we have this posture as a culture now, 2,000 years later, we don't like the word submit. Uh, we, don't, we don't like uh, what we think it probably means. We just, we kind of back up uh, from it a little bit. And so I'm curious, Amanda, for you, what has been your interaction uh, as a woman with that, with that word? Yeah. So I actually, um, for the first 22 years of my life, Grew up mainly with my dad, um, grew up in a super small town, didn't grow up in a Christian household at all. So I don't think I actually ever heard the word submit um, in that way and definitely not a defini definition of biblical submission. So taught to respect authority, but my dad very much taught me to like uh, independence, you're going to defend yourself. Uh, you need to learn to take care of yourself because nobody's going to take care of you. So definitely op opposite of submission. So fast forward 22 years to when I became a Christian. And I fell so in love with Jesus when I actually found that relationship with him that I think I probably had a little bit of self-imposed legalism. It's like I love Jesus so much that I'm going to do what Matt said. I'm going to be really literal about what the Bible says. So it's like it said submit. And I took that hierarchy, patriarchy to like, hey, there is, like, this is my husband, this is me, you submit, kind of like you just, you do what you're told. Now, some of you who know me in this room, you're like, you did not do that. Um, <laughs> I mean, your husband's here. So <laughs> he is he, here. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. He might be standing up in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't say I was good at it. I just said <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that I was thinking like, this is the way it works. And then fast forward 20 more years as I've just grown in my faith and clarity and just a little bit more of like, hey, what is the scripture actually saying, digging into that? 
And like I said, I'm not perfect at it, this whole thing of submission, but I do know what the end goal is, and I know what I'm striving for, and it's not the same thing that I grew up thinking. Yeah, I remember um, growing up in, uh, I grew up in the church, and I grew up in a Baptist church uh, on the East Coast, and I don't ever remember like a, a pastor, somebody teaching about the idea of submitting, but it was more of just um, coming to my own conclusions, watching what was going on around me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I were talking about this this week, and my, my grandmother's probably watching. I love her. Um, <laughs> but she, like, she would do everything at, in, in the house. She did all the cooking, all the cleaning. Um, and, and I always, and, and like, if you would have asked me, like, hey, what does the, the idea of submitting mean, I would have said like, it's, it's doing things you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I would have said. I would have gotten there somehow, some way. And I don't think like my grandmother was doing all those things she didn't want to do. Um, but I think I was just kind of watching that so much so that when Vanessa and I were engaged, we went over to my grandparents' house for dinner and she is watching my grandmother doing <laughs> all the things. And we, we left dinner that night and we get in the car and she looks at me and she goes, just so you know, when we're married, it's not going to be like that. <laughs> and I said, hey, let me read you this verse in Ephesians 5. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but I had a very similar like view of the word submit. Like right. submitting means I've been defeated. Yes. I'm not going to be able to do it my way and my way is the best way. And so it's not going to be any fun. I'm going right. to do all these things. That, that I don't want to do. So again, a lot of times when we talk about, you know, this idea of, of submitting, it has this negative, um, has this negative connotation. Now, let me just say this. I think it's important for us to, to say this, and I'm going to say it because I'm a guy. Um, <laughs> uh, because this verse would hit differently depending on where we, where we are in our country, yep. right? If we were having this service maybe uh, in the South, or in even another kind of denomination of church, there would be people, and what I'm about to say, they would stand up and they would walk out. That's the truth of it. It is. Okay, so this is the tension of this verse. But I, I, I would say this. So guys, we, we've got to receive this uh, this morning. Um, that um, that ladies, ladies in the room, mar married ladies in the room, what, what this verse is not saying, we're going to talk about what it is saying, but what it's not saying is, is that submission is blind obedience. That's not what Paul's saying. What he's not saying is, is that the husband can walk in and tell his wife to do whatever he wants her to do, and then, and then the wife is supposed to do it. That's not what Paul is saying here. And I've, I've been around a, enough couples where I've seen this verse leveraged in a negative way. That they're taking, you know, men will take this verse out of context and then use it to manipulate their spouse or to get their spouse to do something that they want them to do. And guys in the room, you just got to know that if you've ever done that, that's not what Paul's saying. You are misusing, you're abusing uh, the words in scripture. And so that, that's not, that's what we're not saying. That this is just a free-for-all for guys to walk in with their spouses and say whatever they want. And ladies, you just have to say yes every single time. That is not what Paul uh, is saying. And so I think a good working definition for what Paul is saying um, is this. This is kind of this is the churchy version. We'll simplify it up. But I think this is what it is. I think submission is you choosing to put yourself under someone for their good and God's glory. That's what I think submission is. It's your choice. It's not somebody coming in and telling you um, what to do. This is your choice. You could say it like this. Submission is giving something up for the good of someone else. Giving something up for the good uh, of, someone, uh, of, of someone else. Yeah, and sometimes I think uh, we get ourselves in that situation. You think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give something up for the good of someone else. And there's a little fear behind that, right? Because if yeah. I do that, are you actually going to, are you going to give that back to me? And so we fight against that submission. And like we've said, we, we associate submission with weakness. We associate it with control. Um, it's just, it's a lot of negativity around that. And so when we do submit, I think some of us, um, we submit and we don't really, we don't really want to, but maybe at times you felt like you haven't had a choice. Maybe it is for some of the reasons that Matt was talking about, manipulation reasons or whatever. We feel like we don't have a choice in submission. But the truth is that submission is all about choice. And that's what Paul was writing about. It's, yeah. it's about them, not about you. So think about this analogy. I think this is helpful um, to really understand the idea of submission. 
Um, we probably all this ha have this in common, this scenario where you've been on an airplane, right? <laughs> um, and so you, you're, you're taking a flight, and, and there's, you know, when you're sitting, sitting there, there's always an armrest. There's only one armrest, but there's two people. You know what why? I'm saying? Why? Why do they do that? I don't know why they do that. But there's, you know, <laughs> there, there's only one armrest. And so you get this tension where the armrest is beneficial for both. At least I think so, because I like it, right? Um, that's why some of you get there and you take, you know, the armrest right away because you make your presence known. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then sometimes there's always that awkwardness, like you're both having it, you know, like you're half and half. Mm. And so you're touching. And really the best part of the armrest is not the front part, it's the back part. It is. And so, you know, there, there's two people, but there's only one, there's only one armrest. And submitting would, would come to a place to say, you know what? I know this, this armrest would actually benefit you. And so I'm going to, you know what? I, I will default to that and I'm going to let you, you have it, right? And some of you have never done that and you need to <laughs> repent of your sins, okay? <laughs> You've never done that. Um, but I think that's a good analogy. There's just one thing and, and submitting is trying to figure out who, who will this benefit the most? And I'm going to leverage, you know, all of me, all my time, all my energy, all my resources to benefit you. Right. I'm choosing. You're not walking in and telling me I get the armrest. Right. I'm, I'm thinking who, who should get the armrest. Right. And, and I'm willing <laughs> to, to say, you know what, I'm going to submit and let you have it because I think it's actually better for you. Yeah, and I think also just going back to that verse 22 that I read in the beginning, wives submit to your husbands. If we actually go back to the original Greek um, and look at that, in verse 22, the original text actually would have read like this. It would have said, wives to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So what was missing in that? The verb, the verb. submit. <laughs> right? Some of the ladies are like, it's not even in there. <laughs> Some of you just jumped yeah, for yeah. joy. You're like, yes. Um, no, it's not. In the original Greek, going back to that verse, the verb is not in there. The verb actually gets into verse 22 because it's implied from the previous verse. And that's, that's just how the writing was then. So Matt, yeah, so what here's what, here's what verse 21 verse says, say? okay? Here's verse 21. <laughs> it says this, submit. So there's our verb that gets brought into verse 22. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so um, Paul, what, what he's saying is, listen, this idea of submission, this is a Christian principle. This is a Christian practice. Now, it just so happens that he, he uses the, the first application of this idea of, of submission in marriage. But this, it's, it's bigger than that. What Paul's saying is if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, submitting is, is submitting in every relationship in your life. Not, not just with you and your spouse, but with your coworker, with your boss, with your neighbor. Um, th this is a Christian idea. This is for, for men in the context of women, but also for men and men and women and women. This is, this is a kind of a worldview of how we look at interacting with people uh, in this world. So it's, it's for all of our relationships, and not just, not just some. And now, this plays well in the context of marriage because a great marriage, I would argue is really a submission competition. It's a competition to see, which feels weird saying a little bit, it does. but it's a competition to see who can uh, submit the best. I, I've said this for years. A great marriage is a race to the back of the line. Not to the front, but to the back. Right. It's the idea of, <clears throat> of submitting. And it's a great marriage is, or any great relationship is awesome when you have two people that, that have the same mindset of, hey, I'm going to think about you more than I think about my, myself. So Paul says, listen, submission is a mutual thing. It's a competition, not just for one person, not just for the spouse or the wife. It's for both. It's a, it's a mutual thing. This is going back and forth. And so let me, married folks in the room, how many of you, raise your hand right now. How many of you, now on campus as well, want a healthy marriage? Go ahead, just raise your hand. It'd be awkward if you're sitting by your spouse, you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> yes, we would all say, <laughs> you're like, mm -mm, not uh, me, no. I don't want health. <laughs> yes, you want healthy relationships. And this is what Paul's leaning into. He's saying, listen, if you want healthy relationships, this is a Christian principle that if you live out, it'll help you produce those things. 
Yes, we're going to continue on um, in our reading. So Ephesians 5, 23 and 24 says this. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, should submit to their husbands in everything. And I actually want to read that same verse, 23 and 24, but I'm going to read it in the message this time, just because I think it clarifies a little bit. It says, the husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. And you can see in that approach matters, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. And then in verse 25, so guys, this is where Paul begins to lean in with us. says this, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So <clears throat> guys in the room here, and ladies too, this is good to know. Like 2,000 years ago, when Paul was writing this to the church in Ephesus, when they're reading this, it would have been the women who would have been freaking out. It would have been the guys. <laughs> the guys would have been receiving this. They'd be like, uh, Paul, just clarity. I feel like what you're saying is that our wives are on the same level as us. That's not what you're saying, right? <laughs> because, I, I don't, because I tell my woman what to do. She, she can't tell me what to do. That can't be what you're, you're saying, right? And, and Paul's going, no, that's kind of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're called to love your wife. Submission is mutual. It goes back and forth. See, because you're a Christian, your wife is not your property. You have a different worldview than what the world is preaching. And then guys are going, uh, listen, I hear you talking about <laughs> Jesus and loving his church. And we know how that story went because Jesus died. <laughs> You're not saying we should die, do you? Paul goes, I'm not finished. Look what he says. Verse 28, in the same way, Paul goes, yeah, in the same way. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And look at this, verse 33. However, here's the bottom line. Each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So Paul goes, yes, it's mutual. It's mutual. It goes back and forth. So yeah, we go from wives submit to your husbands, right? To this really, Paul's writing to the men saying, hey, this is how you're to love your wife. And so ladies in the room, I think it's important instead of living in that place of like um, fear and negativity regarding submitting, Jesus was fighting for your value in this verse. In Ephesians 5, he, he was fighting for your worth, your dignity, before it was even a conversation, um, anywhere in the world, it's like Jesus was fighting for that equality. Like you're the same. It's mutual submission. Yeah, if you're, if you're a lady in the room and you're not a Christian, I would argue you should be just because of this. That long before the, the world got the idea of equality between men and women, Jesus was preaching it Yeah. 2,000 years ago. I mean, he brought women into his inner circle um, and then, because of his teaching, the, the earliest apostles and disciples are preaching, you know, <laughs> saying, hey, women, you're included. You've got value. You've got worth, which nobody else in the world was preaching that. Um, and Jesus says, no, no, no. See, for Christians, it's different. Right. And guys, the, the idea here is this is mutual. This, this is, this is a something in healthy relationships. This is going back and forth. This is mutual a submission. This is a submission uh, competition. Now, um, what, what does the, you know, the, the application would be like, what does this look like? And not just in the context of marriage, but if this is a Christian principle that we should be submitting to all the relationships in our life, 
What does that actually look like? And it just so happens, Amanda and I, we work together, okay? And, and I, again, I, I serve primarily here at the Fred campus and Amanda uh, at the NIWAD campus. Uh, and we've, we've had to practice this with each other. We have a little story. We have a story. Uh-huh, we do. Yeah. Uh-huh. Where one time we didn't do this well. We did not do this well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think if we go back about three years, I was just starting my job. I've been at Rocky for a long time, but I was just starting my job three years ago as the campus pastor at the Niwa campus. Matt, campus pastor at the Frederick campus. So I would, if fair to say, three years ago when I started, our campus is probably not really same team mentality, right? Like a little bit out for for ourselves, not really for each other. So one of the things we started talking about is we really, we wanna develop that. We wanna be for each other. We want our campuses to be for each other. And so started working on that. It was a little bumpy (laughs) going into it. So we had a conversation. I think we had a meeting Uh one day. And in that meeting, I wanted something my way. You wanted something your way. Right. One of us might have been more right than the other. <laughs> but um, so we continue in the conversation. Conversation ends. Matt leaves. And I'm not done with the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so I call Matt on the phone. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, hey, we're still arguing this out. Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm fighting at this point. I'm fighting for my campus, what I want, my thing. Yeah. Matt digs in. Yeah. And I start fighting too. <laughs> And with Amanda in her, her role now, th- this was a little bit different because usually there wasn't somebody like fighting on the other side. And so now we have somebody in this position who's, who's pushing back and holding their ground. And so I'm like, game on. You want to you wanna fight? We'll fight because I'm right and you're wrong. And now I'm going to show you that I'm, I'm right and you're wrong. And then like 10 minutes into the conversation, I realized I'm never going to get her to change her mind. <laughs> And that's really frustrating for me. Um, And so then we get to this point in the conversation. Well, you have two eights in this conversation, by the way. So nobody's given up anytime soon. So anyway, we're battling back and forth. And I'm pushing in pretty hard. And may or may not have, (laughs) I wouldn't say yelling, elevated. I think it was yelling. I think it was yelling. Yeah, I think it was yelling. (laughs) Elevated conversation for sure. And all of a sudden, in the midst of my elevated (laughs) conversation, I hear nothing on the other end. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, he did not hang up on me. I thought you said bye. And so I no, thought no, the conversation no, no, no. was done. <laughs> you wished I said bye. <laughs> I, I needed the conversation to be done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I did not say bye. I thought in the middle of your yelling, I thought you said bye. And I was uh, like, okay, bye. <laughs> and then uh, 10 minutes later. So I call back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I say, what? You hung up on me? <laughs> And, and Matt I, says, I thought you said bye. I said, no, I clearly did not say goodbye. And then I learned never hang up on Amanda ever again. <laughs> to this day, I always go, bye, <laughs> just so you can hear me, so you know I'm not hanging up on you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we didn't, we didn't do our best in that moment. But what it did teach us is that putting yourself last, learning to listen to the other person and, and really unifying our campuses in a way that we hadn't been. Yeah, and I think, so here, here's just a good point for us. We're, we're in the midst of this conversation. You know, part of my job is, is I lead at the Frederick campus. Part of your job is you lead at the Niwot campus. We, in our job, it tells us that we should be thinking about the campus that we're at. That's part of our job. Um, and, and when you get into a, a conversation here about maybe there's just some resource here and only one campus can have it, um, you, you know, mutual submission here is, is coming into the conversation and, and getting outside of that and saying, okay, wh- what, is, what is the best for the Niwad campus? And what is the best for the Frederick campus? And it's the other campus pastor thinking in that way. It's coming into the conversation and saying, I, I think I know what's best here, but I've got to look at the bigger picture as well because a win for Niwa is a win for Fred and vice versa. And, and so I think we eventually got to this place where it was like, hey, help me understand why you really do think that this is the best way to go about this. And eventually you get to a place where it's much more same team and you're going, yeah, game on. This is, the, you're right, this is a better place for Niwa to use this than it is for Fred, and it leads to a healthy place. But when you're engaging and only thinking about what you want, then all of a sudden it becomes really combative. 
Yeah, and I think sometimes we think even outside of just this working relationship, but in our relationships, we think that if somebody goes to us and tells us that we're wrong, or we think we always have to tell people that they're right. It's okay to tell people the best thing for me might be for Matt to tell me that I'm wrong. I'm not going to like it in the moment, <laughs> <laughs> but it might be the best yeah, thing but for me. But for the right reasons. So married couples, think about this, because I've had, I've had couples say this to me like, okay, so what you're saying is mutual submission is, is I'm, I'm always agreeing with what my spouse says. That's right. not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is because maybe um, a version of Vanessa, my wife submitting to me, right, is saying something that's hard for me to hear. Right. But the reason why she's saying it is not for her good. It's for mine. She knows like, oh, he just said something real dumb. <laughs> or he's about to spend money he doesn't need to spend. Or right. he's about to leverage something he doesn't need to leverage. Mutual submission would, would be for her to engage with me, not for her benefit, but for mine. She's looking out for me. And, and I think that's a way that you can continue to build trust in your relationship or a working relationship. Right. That, that Amanda can speak in and say, you know what? I, I just don't think that's the best way to handle that. Or I don't think you should have said that to that person on staff or whatever. Uh, that, that I think that's a version of submission. Right. It's you looking out for me and going, hey, I think you need to hear this truth. But oftentimes we do that in such a way where we've got the wrong approach. And at the end of the day, we're thinking about ourselves. I'm saying something to you you don't want to hear because it makes me feel good. And I'm not looking out for you. Right. And that is a version of mutual submission. So it's not blind uh, obedience. So wh where does the motivation come from? How, how do we how do we do this well? Why do we want to do it well? That's a great question. So I want to read this verse in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, um, talking about that motivation. It says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Yeah, see, you know why we submit? Because Jesus submitted first. That's why. Because Jesus did this really, really well. He submitted to the Father, went to the cross, died, died for us. And then in turn, he looks at his church and he says, do you see how I submitted? Now you do likewise. Submit to one another. It's another version of how we love one another. So for us to be able to build some application in what Paul is trying to say, and not just in the context of marriage, but all relationships, I, I, wanna, I just want to ask you this morning, how are you doing? How are you doing with this, with this idea? And, and I'm not talking about how is your spouse doing. <laughs> I'm not asking how your coworkers are doing or how your boss is doing or how your neighbor's doing. I'm asking, how are you doing? How are you doing? Because here's what I know. There are a lot of days I don't do well because most of us, if not all of us, woke up this morning and our natural thought was to think about ourselves. Right. And Paul says, and Jesus says, you got to get outside of that. You've got to get to a place in your life where you're submitting to one another. And I think there's some, like, if you're just like, what does that actually practically look like in our relationships? All you have to do is, is do a, a one another study. If you just Google the, you know, the one another's in the New Testament, you're going to get all of these things that, that I believe fit into what it looks like to submit to one another. So I'll just run through a couple of them real quick and think about, yeah, how am I doing with these things? All right. Paul in Romans says this, be devoted to one another, honor one another, he says in 1 Corinthians, have equal concern for each other. In Galatians, he says, serve one another. Uh, last week in Ephesians 4, Paul said, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Again, in chapter 4, he says this. We could just stop here. Be <laughs> kind, compassionate, and forgiving one another. I mean, anybody in here just like killing it, right? I'm just, I do that so well. If you do, just talk to your spouse. They'll let you know the truth. In Hebrews, it says, encourage one another. Peter says in 1 Peter, love each other and offer hospitality to each other. Again, in 1 Peter, he says, be humble toward one another. Galatians 6 says, carry each other's burdens. You'll see this all through, through Scripture. I mean, the idea of mutual submission is getting outside of yourself and thinking about others 
more. Yeah, and when we do this well, and I think we've both admitted, we don't always do this well, and I think all of us in the room can say we, we don't get it right all the time. But when we do, when we do get it right, submission isn't the thing we've always thought. It's, it's not the negative, it's not the controlling, it's not that. It's actually submission actually brings like freedom and purpose to our relationships. It brings health. When we think about ourselves less, we have richer relationships. And it's that submission competition. It, it's all of me to benefit you. And it's exactly what Jesus did for us. He's like, I'm going all in. I'm going to give all of me to benefit you. I'm going to go to the cross for you. That's what he did for us. And then he called us to love each other like that. Love one another. Those one another's Matt just went through. And so I think it's a reminder for us. Submission isn't what you've always thought but we do want to be in that submission competition. It's healthy. And I love Andy Stanley said this. He said, Christians always go first because that's what Jesus did. And so right before this, Paul in Ephesians, he, he, he has this big conversation about, you know, as a Christian, you should live differently. You should live differently. And he goes through a couple of things. And I think this is the fourth thing that he brings up, this idea of mutual submission. And here's why. Because the world... Um, does not live like, like that. The world does not submit. I mean, just look at our culture today. We, we want, you know, the world wants nothing to do with it. And I think what Paul is saying is he's going, listen, church, if you choose to mutually submit like Jesus did, just like Jesus submitted to you, I mean, think about that. The Son of God submitted to you. The world will take notice. If, if you would have a marriage that was defined by how you are, you know, racing for the back of the line, if you would have a marriage that would have two people thinking more about the other person than themselves, if you would have a church that was filled with hundreds of people where every single person was always thinking about somebody else, you know, how can I leverage me for the sake of, of somebody else? Paul says, listen, the world will take notice and you will be one step closer to the heart of God if you would choose to live in such a way. And when people would walk into this church, if they would see, you know, they, they might not be able to say this is what it is, but if they would get to a place where they go, man, there's something different about this, these group of people. And we would know, yeah, what's different is that we've been called to submit to one another, to leverage everything I have for the benefit and the sake of somebody else. And just think about how your relationships would change, not just your marriage, but your coworkers and your friends. I mean, aren't those the friends you want? Isn't that the kind of person you want to be married to? And when we do this for one another, good things, good things happen. Good things happen. So I want to encourage you. Think about it. What does this look like for you? And how do you do this better? And here's the trap, especially married couples. When you leave this place, the goal isn't to be driving home and going, let me tell you what you could do better. Because <laughs> that's what we want to do. This is not what we do. We look at ourselves and we go, how can I leverage more of me for the sake of you? That's what we got to get to. That's right. All it's of awesome. me for you. All right. Let me pray for us. We'll end our time together. So, Father, uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to have a, a discussion that for many is difficult. And I pray that you would help us in the context of all of our relationships to have the same mindset as your son who submitted to you who served us extremely well. 2,000 years ago, he was willing to go to the cross to die for our sins. And I pray that, that we would live life in such a way that we would see the people around us and not leverage what we can get from them, but that we would have a mindset that we would look at how you have gifted us and that we may use our lives for the benefit and for the sake of others. I pray that we would be that church I pray that we would live out those marriages. I pray that we would be those kind of friends. I pray that in the workplace, we would be those kind of workers, looking around for opportunities to benefit the other people in our lives. That we would be Christians who are willing and wanting to mutually submit to everybody that you have placed in our life. And we thank you for Jesus and the example that he has given to us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Hey, it's been amazing to be with you guys today, wherever you're watching from, Niwot Campus, online, Fred Campus. A little celebration from last week. We did our impact Christmas tags between our both campuses and online. They're all gone. Come on, you let's guys clap for that. That's all. good stuff. It's amazing. So don't forget, you need to bring those back wrapped. Do us a favor, wrap those yeah, gifts. Yeah, wrap them up, wrap them up. <laughs> Bring those back by next week, December 5th. I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your Sunday. See you next week. We'll see you later.